So welcome to this first session of the seventh annual research conference. I'm very happy that I'm able to share the session that I was asked uh, to chair this ch session. Um, and I would like to give the floor right away to Peter Karadi and uh, his paper that he wrote together with his co-authors, Raphael Schönle and Jesse Wurston, on price selection in the microdata. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for the, for the organizers for, for having the paper in the program. Uh, yeah, so this is joint work with, uh, with Raphael Schoenle and Jesse Wurston, and uh, the usual disclaimer applies. So, so what I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about is, uh, is price selection in the microdata, and the motivation is, is quite clear. So this is a you know, classic question in, uh, in macroeconomics, uh, that uh, the rigidity of the price level actually influences the, the real effects of the monetary policy, and also the amplification uh, through demand type channels. And uh, from previous research, we know that uh, prices change infrequently. Uh, and in standard uh, price setting models, this low frequency of price changes implies that the aggregate price level is rigid. But in, uh, in models where the price uh, rigidity is microfounded by, uh, by fixed cost, of menu cost of, of price adjustment, like the model of Carlos of Lucas, actually the price level can stay flexible even if only a small fraction of, of prices adjust. And the reason is that uh, in, these, in these frameworks, large price changes are going to be endogenously selected. And, and why is this the case? So if, if there is a fixed cost of adjusting the prices, then it's optimal for the firms to concentrate on the products which, have the most, which are the most misaligned and adjust the prices of, of these products. So, so this way they can uh, mitigate the cost of, of price adjustments. But then if an aggregate shock hits, then uh, these are going to be the most misaligned prices that are get adjusted. They will change a lot because they are not just get adjusted by the aggregate shock, but they are also misaligned in the, in the, the product level and the firm level. So, so there is going to be an interaction between the idiosyncratic uh, product level uh, the, uh, shocks and the aggregate shock, and this will raise the flexibility of the aggregate price level. So, so what, what is it we are going to do in this paper? We are going to revisit this uh, Golosov and Lucas critique of, uh, of, of price rigidity by looking at microdata, and we would like to measure uh, the strengths of the selection effect there. Uh, so we are going to uh, do it by measuring both the price misalignment uh, to, to measure you know, the product level uh, causes of the selection and identify aggregate shocks. So, so they identify the macro, macro uh, uh, shocks that trigger these effects. So what, what is it we are going to find? We are going to find evidence for state dependence in price setting. So we will find that the probability of adjustment is going to increase with price misalignment unconditionally. So, so if we kind of in, uh, uh, look at just, uh, so pool, pool the data over time. But importantly, we find uh, that the, the selection as we defined it is not there. So condition on aggregate shock the size of the misalignment is going to be uh, immaterial. Instead, what we find that the kind of state-dependent adjustment is, uh, is best described by an active gross extensive margin. So there is going to be a shift between the, the frequency of price increases versus price decreases. So if there is a tightening, there is going to be uh, less increases, more decreases, and, and that kind of uh, accounts for most, most of the adjustment uh, in, the, in the data. So we, we think that this uh, provides some guidance for model choice and policy implication. So the model is, uh, so the, these results are consistent with mildly state dependent models with uh, linear adjustment hazard and, uh, and actually sizable monetary non-neutrality. So I'm, uh, in, I'm, I'm in, the, in the talk, I'm going to first talk about the framework, uh, explain it a bit more in detail, how, how we define selection, and then go to the data. In the data, I'm going to concentrate in the presentation on supermarket uh, data, uh, and, and going to uh, estimate both the price gap 
uh, proxy. We are going to use di uh, distance from competitors' prices. And for an aggregate shock, we are going to use uh, a, a credit shock. But in the paper, we show that uh, our results are robust to, to using a more general uh, uh, producer price index, microdata, and other uh, price gap proxy, uh, other proxies for price gap, as well as other aggregate shocks. Then, then we look at we combine this data to, to look at selection and, uh, and, and show some robustness. If I have time, I am uh, going to talk about uh, the literature a bit more. So, so let me kind of jump into the conceptual framework. And, and uh, the goal is to identify channel of adjustment of the price level to the aggregate shock. B basically, you should uh, think of this as, a, as kind of an accounting uh, framework in an environment with, with sticky prices. In the original Caballero angle framework, uh, they, they identified two channels. So one is the intensive margin, which uh, looks at when an aggregate shock hits, all firms which adjust their prices are going to adjust it by more. So there's going to be larger adjustment for each, each adjusting firm. And then there is an extensive margin channel which is uh, that uh, there are going to be new adjusters. And these, this channel is the only one which is active in state-dependent price setting models. Our, our contribution is to separate this extensive margin channel into two uh, uh, channels. One is what we call the gross extensive margin, which is going to be a shift between price increases and decreases, and the selection effect. And uh, how, how we define it is, is uh, looking at better larger gaps. So prices with larger gaps adjust with higher probability condition on an aggregate shock. And uh, to, uh, we, we argue that actually uh, so previous, uh, recent research have shown that in, in, a, in a lot of these models, the dynamics after a monetary shock is, is actually quite similar. So it's sufficient to concentrate on either the impact effect or, or an effect at a, at a particular horizon, uh, at, at least approximately. So what uh, the starting point is, is a price adjustment, a model with price adjustment friction. So there is the price adjustment is lumpy. Uh, what uh, Caballero Engel and, and others pointed out is that it's very useful to concentrate on, a, on, a, on the price gap, uh, which is defined as the difference of the price uh, from uh, a theoretical optimal price. And uh, the, the, this optimal price is influenced continuously by both the product level and aggregate, aggregate factors, while the price level, because of these price adjustment frictions, are, are adjusting only occasionally. So, so using the price gap, we can decompose uh, inflation into the, a multiple of several terms. One is the density of the price gap multiplied by the probability and the size of the probability of adjustment. And this is the, the lambda x, this is the hazard function. And the size of the adjustment conditional gap, which is just, just minus the, the gap itself. So this is uh, uh, illustrated on this figure, which shows how the adjustment happens in, a, in an assets pricing framework. There, the, the shaded area shows the, the, the price gap. The, this uh, purple hazard function, step hazard function, shows the probability of adjustment. It is zero if the gap is smaller than a threshold and one above this threshold. And then the dark shaded area shows what happens, and these are the price decreases uh, in, uh, in this example, and, and these are what actually contributes to, to, the, to the inflation itself. Here you can see that, uh, that actually the decreases are, are large. But importantly, uh, the, what, uh, this, this fact that, that in the SS pricing framework the price decreases are large doesn't uh, imply selection as, as we define it. Here you, you see actually two uh, versions of the, of the model. One, one is where, uh, you, like before, when, when the, the SS pricing is a step function, the other one is a, is a linear adjustment hazard function. There uh, you can see that uh, the, the probability of adjustment is still increasing, but it's not, it's not jumping like, uh, like in the SS pricing framework. What, uh, what can be, what, what we propose, and, uh, and, and this is, uh, has, has already been 
uh, done in the literature is to show that you can decompose the inflation into two components. One is kind of based on the averages, average size and average frequency of adjustment, and the covariance term. And the covariance term is asking how the size of the adjustment covaries with the, with the probability of adjustment. And if, if this covariance is, is positive, then you have uh, state dependence in the, in the uh, price setting. Importantly, models where, uh, like, the, like the Carvo price setting model, where the hazard is, is flat, this covariance term is zero. So there is no state dependence in, in price setting. But this is not what we, what we call uh, a selection. Instead, uh, this, for, for selection, we want to ask that when an aggregate shock hits, what, uh, uh, kind of, uh, what channels are active. And uh, you can show that, uh, that this kind of three terms uh, uh, become, uh, become active. Uh, one is the intensive margin, which is just all the prices which are uh, adjusting anyway, they are going to be adjusting by more. And then on the extensive margin, there are going to be two terms. One is the gross extensive margin, which is, how, uh, which is that uh, there are going to be uh, more decreases uh, than, uh, than increases. And then the selection term is asking how much the new changes, the probability of, of, or, or the position of those who are changing now because of the shock are uh, covered with the, with the size. So basically, is it true that larger price changes are now going to be changed by more uh, with higher probability than before? So in the, in the figure, you can see that, that in terms of the selection, there is going to be a big difference between a model with, uh, in Golos of Lucas, which is on the, on the left-hand side, and a model with, uh, with a mildly state-dependent pricing, where, where you have uh, uh, this, uh, this linear hazard. The, there, the, the new, in, in both cases, the, the dark shaded area show the position of the new uh, decreases. So, so these are the, the ones which kind of get triggered by the, by the aggregate shock. And you see that uh, in, in case of the Golosom Lucas case, those, the, the new uh, decreases are concentrated at a, at a high point, so they are going to be changed by a large, large amount, while in case uh, of, uh, of a mildly state-dependent model, the, they are dispersed, like, uh, like on the, on the right-hand side, and, uh, and in this case, there is going to be uh, no selection. So this uh, table just uh, overviews what, what I just said. Uh, the, in the time-dependent model, it's only the intensive margin which is effect, effective in SS and convex hazard models. There are intensive margin, gross extensive margin, and selection. And in a linear hazard model, uh, the selection is not active. Instead, the effects are coming from the gross, gross extensive margin. So the, the paper uh, is, uh, is looking, so, so the next part is, is to look at, to measure the shape of the hazard function and gap density in the data assess the strengths of the margin of, of adjustment, both unconditionally and conditional and aggregate shock. So let me, let me jump into this. So the, the data that we are using is supermarket data from the, from the United States. Uh, the, the advantage of this data, it's, it's very, very granular. So it, uh, it has uh, 170,000 products, also wide coverage in the US, so it's uh, over 50 markets. And also, it has a long time series, so it's available for, for 12 years. So it's, it's a very suitable, suitable for our, our causes because it has both granularity, which helps us to identify high quality information about close substitutes of the exact same product, as well as long time series, so we can identify aggregate fluctuations. So we do some, uh, some cleaning of the data, we filter out temporary discounts and do some time aggregation to, to go from weekly data to, to a monthly, monthly data. So the, to, to look at uh, price gaps, we argue that a relevant component of the gap is actually observable. So what we use it is, is a distance from the average price of clo close competitors. So we, we observe a particular price, we can see the, the exact same price in other stores, and uh, 
and, and we will use how far the aggregate pri uh, the, the, the price is from this the average of competitors. We actually control for some store fixed effects to control for regional variation or, or amenities. But the point is that, that if stores want to avoid price misalignment, then, uh, then this is going to be a reasonable measure of the price gap. They, they actually want to do it in both directions. They, they don't want their prices to be higher than the competitors because then they, they uh, will face low demand, but they also don't want them to, to be too low because then they can increase profits uh, by, by increasing the price some more. So, so formally, the, the competitor's reference price gap is, is going to be defined as, as below, uh, where we are just taking the average of the exact same uh, product in, in competitor's prices after taking some, some, uh, some store fixed effect. The, we, we also control for, for unobserved heterogeneity. So, so basically, from the gaps, we, we deduct estimated product store fixed effects and, and this actually uh, is, is important for, for our results. So, so this is uh, one of the main figures of the paper. So we, here what, what you see is that how the probability of a price adjustment uh, changes uh, with, this, with the competitor price gap. And uh, what you see is that uh, importantly, the, the probability of adjustment increases uh, significantly with distance from zero. It, it, it is also not, not exactly, but approximately uh, linear, and also uh, positive at zero and, and, and mildly, mildly asymmetric. Actually, these, these results are, are uh, in line with, with previous, previous results, which usually used uh, uh, more narrower uh, data. If, if you look at uh, the size of the adjustment, uh, or the average size of adjustment as a function of the price gap, then, then you get the, the following figure. Uh, what's striking here is that there is an almost one-to-one -one, uh, linear uh, relationship between the size of adjustment and the gap. So if you, if you know that, uh, that, there is a, that the firm faces a gap, then on average, it wants to close this gap. Uh, then uh, as, uh, so, so this shows that, uh, that our measure is actually a relevant component of the gap indeed. And uh, the, the last figure shows the density of the, of the gaps, which shows that uh, despite sales filtering and store fixed effect, there is still a sizable dispersion and, uh, and fat tails of the, of the distribution. So, so one thing we can do right away, uh, just by, by using, using this, um, uh, this hazard function and density, is to do the decomposition that has been uh, that we, we proposed at the beginning, because for this we just need the the, the hazard, so need just these objects, and um, and and do uh, do a calculation. So so our, our goal is to, to to separate these three three channels. If we if we do this, what we find is that the, the relative contribution of the channels is that the, the intensive margin is the most most important. The gross extensive margin increases the effect by, uh, by around one third of the, of the intensive margin, and the selection effect uh, in this uh, example is, is minuscule in this way. So just, just to emphasize, this means that the extensive margin effect is important. So it's not, um, um, we, are, we are not saying that that's, uh, that's what these results are saying. Instead, uh, what mostly drives the results can be, is, is just the shift between between increases and decreases uh, after after a shock. So, so the the next what we do is uh, is try to kind of reassess the same thing using an aggregate shock. So here we are kind of doing it unconditionally without uh, looking at how, how the the economy responds to an aggregate shock. We we want to see see it in the data whether these these results uh, borne out. So. What we, what we use for this is a, is a credit shock. So this, uh, we are looking at the sizable exogenous tightening of credit conditions, which we identify using timing restriction. So the idea is to, to look at the increase in, in, a, in a measure of, the, of, of a premium, of excess bond premium, so basically a default fee corporate spread created by, by uh, Simon Grigrist and Ivan Zakrajsek. Uh, without any contemporaneous effect on activity prices or interest rates. So we, 
uh, this is this is how we we identify kind of the, an uh, exogenous causal shift in 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 credit. So just to just to show you how the the, the re, how the economy responds to a shock like this, uh, let me first uh, run just a series of local projection uh, OLS regressions, where we look at a different variable uh, different variables of interest, uh, and and we are interested in how this credit shock uh, passes through to uh, to to their uh, behavior for for controls. We are going to use uh, one, one to 12 months legs of uh, the, the consumer price index, industrial production, and the one year uh, rate, one year treasury rate, uh, as well as the, the excess bond premium. So if the, these figures show how the, how the inputs look, uh, look like. So there is a, there's a shift in the, the excess bond premium, which kind of dies out within a, within a year. The in interest rate, so monetary policy responds to it, so eases, eases, but it's not enough to offset the effect on industrial production, which is, which, uh, is, is sizable and, and persistent, and also the core CPI, which is uh, the, the, the price index uh, that we look at, is, is declining uh, actually slowly and, and peaks around uh, uh, 24, 24 months. After, after the effect. If, if we run the same regression using our supermarket index, just to show you that, that it makes sense, uh, the, the results are, are actually similar to, to what happens to the, the core CPI. The effects are not before 24 months. So this, is, this uh, is, is actually motivates us to look at this 24 months horizon, which is basically the, the, the peak level effect of, of the shock. So for to, to look at selection, we would like to combine this product level proxy with this aggregate shock. So the question is, uh, again, is are, are the new adjusters after the shock have large, large gaps? And uh, our approach is that we are looking at selection as an interaction between the aggregate shock and the product level proxy and ask whether it in, uh, influences the probability of, uh, of price adjustment. So the, the linear probability model that we, we follow are, are, are shown here. Uh, the dependent variables are the uh, indicator of, of a price increase or a price decrease between period T and the, and the, and the H, H period in the future. In a particular, for a particular product in a particular store uh, and uh, as, a, as a, uh, explanatory variables, we, we have the price gap uh, in uh, Kind of months, months before the shock, to control for the regular effect of the of the uh, price gap, then the excess bond premium to to control for the effect of the aggregate shock on the probability of adjustment. This is going to be kind of the average effect or the or the the cross extensive margin effect, and the interaction term. And this is our focus. The interaction term is is asking when a, when an aggregate shock hits, are the prices which are which are changed. Have a larger gap or not? So this is going to be the the, the selection effect. We also have uh, various controls. So for example, we, we control for the age of the price to control for time dependence. We have series of aggregate controls. Actually, these are the same same ones as um, as we had as we had in the in the local projection exercise I showed you before. And we also have product store fixed effects as well as uh, calendar months fixed effects. So to control for, for an unexplained cross-sectional heterogeneity as well as uh, seasonality. And we, we cluster standard errors across categories and time. So, so this is the kind of the main, main table of the, of, the result of the paper, which, uh, which shows how on the, on the left uh, column, the, how the price increases, the right column, but how the price decreases, uh, the probability of price decreases respond to, to these, uh, these various factors. What, uh, what, what you see is that the effect of the, of the gap itself has a significant effect. The shock itself also has a significant effect, but their interaction term is insignificant. And this is uh, consistent in, in various uh, uh, robustness exercises. And, and in terms of quantity, so the, the, it, it, these are sizable. So what, what we see is that if you move 
from the gap from a first quartile to the third uh, quartile, you see that the probability of price increase is uh, 26 uh, percentage point lower. Also, in, in terms of the, the adjustment of the gross extensive margin is, is uh, sizable, so that uh, one standard aviation credit tightening, which is a 33 basis point, is, uh, is, uh, in, decreases the, the probability of price increase by, by one percentage point. And, and at the same time, uh, uh, increases the probability of price decrease by, by a similar one, so symmetric one percentage point. Uh, but we find kind of no, no selection. Uh, and, but some, some evidence of, of, uh, of time dependence. So if we put together kind of the, the theoretical and the, the empirical results, what we, what we find that in the data, the, there seems to be uh, effective intensive margin, effective gross extensive margin, but no selection. And this is kind of uh, consistent with, with a model with, uh, with linear hazard, but inconsistent with both time dependent models, with like a Calvo model, which assumes constant hazard, uh, or, uh, or SS and COMEX hazard models, like, uh, like Olosov and Lucas. So just, uh, just quickly, uh, let me show you one robustness exercise. So one, one thing which you might worry about is that the linearity assumption in the, in the regressions might be, might be a bit too strong. Uh, so here we are relaxing it and assuming that, uh, so instead of assuming that, uh, that the probability and that the relationship between the gap and the probability of adjustment is linear, we just uh, create different uh, groups of uh, some, some firms with different gap sizes and, and look at how the probability changes with the average size. And, and what you can see is that uh, first, that the relationship is quite linear in, in this case, not, not exactly linear, but, uh, but close. So that's the, the, the red, red lines uh, show that kind of unconditionally there is this relationship, uh, uh, linear relationship between the gap and, uh, and the price increases and the price decreases. And the interaction term, which, which there you, you see the, the blue lines, there the relationship is, is, uh, is insignificant. Uh, at, uh, at zero. So, so if we relax the linearity assumption, we, we find that the, the, the results uh, survive. We, in the paper, we, we run a, a battery of, of other robustness checks. And, uh, and this, this result is, is actually survives in, in, in all cases. So I, uh, I have some time to, to talk uh, quickly about uh, uh, literature, a part of the literature. So the in, in, in the literature, actually, selection is a robust prediction of, of uh, various uh, menu cost models with, with steep hazard functions. So the classic papers are, are Kaplan, Spurber, and Golosov, and Lucas. And actually, in more, more recent iterations, uh, it, it has been found that, that this uh, selection actually turns so it comes back. So, for example, I, I have worked with with uh, Adam Reif, where where we assume that uh, idiosyncratic shock has fat tails, like uh, like uh, in the in the famous paper of uh, Virgilio Midrigan. But we find that uh, that if you uh, assume that that these shocks have a have a particular form, kind of a robust form, then the selection comes back. And similarly, uh, in in paper of Bonomo and Quarters, uh, find that uh, if you have multi-product firms, but assume that uh, that firms still face some uh, fixed cost of adjustment for each product they change, then selection effect can, can come back. But importantly, selection weakens if uh, the, there are, uh, the, the hazard function is flatter because of information frictions or, or uh, random, random menu costs. So our, our paper, we are kind of addressing the same question and we, we try to look at uh, Kind of as an empirical question, so so uh, how the how the hazard function looks like, and and we are not the first looking at uh, looking at uh, the hazard function. Uh, there are kind of two strands of literature. One is is uh, looking at the hazard function implicitly, so estimate des density as hazard function by matching moments, and and for example, Francesco has a, has a great paper doing that and, and finding that that uh, the the uh, a hazard function shape that fits the data most is a, is a quadratic one. Uh, but then there are also other papers looking at explicit uh, hazard function. And interestingly, these papers tend to find that the, that the uh, hazard functions are, are close, to, close to linear. There are also, also other uh, 
papers, which, which actually try to look at selection directly by, uh, by uh, constructing informative models that, uh, that are uh, looking at this, uh, including work of, uh, of Luca de Dola and, uh, and co-authors. So, so let me uh, just conclude. So what we, what we did is uh, we looked at granular supermarket and pipe PPI data in the paper to measure selection. We find evidence for state dependence, but no evidence for, for selection. Instead, we find that the effects coming from the gross extensive margin, and this is consistent with linear hazard and uh, uh, state dependent models. And, and our implications that we uh, draw, draw from this is that uh, that a shift between price increases versus decreases is, is what determines uh, the, the extensive margin and the shape of the hazard function is actually informative about the, the strengths of this shift. So it, it makes uh, a lot of sense to, to concentrate and learn more about the, the shape and, uh, and the, uh, the slope of the hazard function. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Yes. Now we have Francesco uh, Lippi from the INODI uh, Institute for Economics and Finance giving the discussion of this paper. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how to put this? Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to discuss this paper, which is um, very interesting, especially for someone like me who's been working with these models for. Uh, many years. Um, so what do they do in the paper? They consider uh, sticky prices and study, they want to answer questions about the propagation of monetary shocks, in particular credit shocks, but think more generally, you know, how monetary policy works, like uh, Isabel put it. And they have great data uh, to, that are useful to empirically analyze what firms actually do when they come to changing prices. That is, whether or not they change the prices, what Peters called the uh, extensive margin, and how much, by how much prices are changed. And once, so first they characterize uh, firm behavior, then they discuss the implications of this behavior for uh, the propagation of aggregate shocks, which is indeed kind of the name of the game. In this literature, you have two polar models. You have Calvo, where firms, adjust prices just because, you know, the Calvo ferry arrives and they adjust prices. Obviously, we're never happy nor proud to use such a model. Like, you know, you don't tell it to your friends in the business industry, you're doing that because they think you guys are doing this. On the other hand, you have goals of and Lucas where you know everything, there's a fixed cost and you only adjust when you reach that critical threshold. That's also an incredibly exaggerated model. You know, it's probably not gonna be true and it's not true and Peter, I think the main interesting result of this paper is to show very clearly both models are wrong. They're wrong big way. And you can do something more with this data. You can kind of get a very precise idea of where you are in this space spanned between these two extremes. That's what I'm trying to do. So specifically what they do, they measure this excess, these desired adjustments. Okay, so a firm is happy if X is zero. I'm putting a hat because that's really kind of the empirical measure of the X. At some point, I'll bring in the theory X. And they embrace this caballero angle, very nice framework where if you tell me your X, I'm gonna tell you what's the probability that you adjust. So in the extreme models, this is an extreme, it's a simple object. Calvo, this probability is just a number. It, not, it doesn't depend on X. It's a constant function, flat. Golos of Lucas, it's kind of an L-shaped object. It's zero, and then you reach a critical X bar, and shoof, it shoots to infinity in continuous time to one in discrete time. Okay, that's what they do. So they estimate these lambdas. They, what do they find? They find that it's linear. It's very nice. Uh, Eichenbaum, Yaimovic, and Rebello found basically the same using just one supermarket data, linear, linear in the absolute value of X, okay? Um, and then they study, they then, then they want to do more. They say, well, but what if I have aggregate shocks? How do the aggregate shocks affect this probability of price changes? And, and so they run linear regressions of the probability of adjustment on X, epsilon, and, and the interaction term. And I already sort of summarized what are the main results. So let me summarize, you know, the, like the framework that we're using to think about this problem. Is this caballero angle? And it's a nice framework because 
both Calvo and Golosov and Lucas are, in, are nested as, as limiting cases. So there is a firm who control this X, uh, firm I. And now I don't have the hat because, so M star is like the ideal markup and P is the price, the marginal cost. You can see how the aggregate shocks that they have will affect the decisions of the firm because they will affect marginal cost. If credit becomes more expensive, you know, my marginal costs are higher, I may want to change my prices. That's the idea. The assumption in this model is if there is no, you know, these are models written before 2021, so there was very little inflation. So X's are bouncing around because of idiosyncratic shocks. That's mostly what it is. And, and then the theory, the optimal policy will produce one of these hazard functions. The reason why it's probabilistic and it's not zero one, there's several ways to justify this. You know, you could think that the, these fixed costs are random. You draw them from a distribution. So, you know, uh, Peter and I have the same X, but he draws a low adjustment cost, then he adjusts. I don't draw it, I don't adjust, that's the idea. And intuitively, I think it makes sense in many models, the bigger the gap, the bigger the probability. You know, you have bigger motives for doing something. Another big assumption in this model, if you decide to adjust, you close the gap. You do, you change your price such that you jump on top of, you know, mu star. That's not a, an assumption that has to be true in all models. For instance, models with sales or models with high inflation, you do some front loading of inflation. When you adjust, you don't close the gap. You may want to start with a high price. That's, this is just different models. Okay, so if you give me one of these models, if you give me those primitives, then you know, I can basically aggregate for the economy and work out what the economy will look like. What is F? By the way, F in this model will be convex. You, you know, I plot, I wrote down a little note for the Kolmogorov equation, just like he finds. You can compute the aggregate frequency, you can compute several observable moments like distribution of price changes. And, and these results in figure two from the paper are a real beauty. I think they're a real beauty because if you give them to someone like, I mean, for me, they're a real beauty because I work on these things. So, you know, you give me these three figures, first of all, I can say, okay, first figure, great, they're closing the gap. The slope is minus one. It's just like the theory suggests. Remember, it, they didn't have to. You could have seen something very different. The middle figure, there are no Calvo fairies. Again, I feel good. My brother is in business. I don't want to tell him that I'm working with fairies. You know, today I'm at the ECB. I want to tell him we are serious researchers looking at data seriously, no fairies. That's what we find. And the density is convex and symmetric, just like the theory will suggest. So if you are like a caballero angle guy, you can stop here. Okay, let's, you know, analyze how a shock propagates in this model. You don't need to, I mean, they spend a lot of time in the paper discussing selection, which, you know, it's okay, but selection is a little bit like looking at a, a soccer game and counting shooting on the goal. That's nice, but really you wanna count goals because that's in the end what determines whether or not you win. So I'm happy to do stuff about selection, but there's something more interesting. Once you give me a GHF, a generalized hazard function, that's all I need to study how shocks propagate. So this is, I'm using some theory results here. These models can be solved pencil and paper pretty accurately. So these are some results uh, I, I, I produce using you know, a recent paper we have. So in the left-hand side, you see the primitives. These are three generalized hazard function. Uh, you know, the flat one here, the black one is, is Calvo, obviously. Probability doesn't depend on the state. Then there's the Golos of Lucas, like the rugby goal. And then there's a linear absolute value hazard function. Okay, just for fun, in the middle panel is what these three functions predict in terms of shape of observable price size, distribution of the size of the adjustments. And on the right panel, you see like the implications for the propagation of aggregate shocks. Uh, and this is not one simulation. These are analytic results. I can tell you like, you know, it's, it's a proposition. So if you give me these models, I can tell you exactly how much bigger the output response is in, in Calvo, the black line, compared to Golos of Lucas, it's six times bigger in terms of the area. And the, and the linear hazard is actually, you know, in between, a little bit closer to Golos of Lucas. So in spite of the lack of selection, in spite, uh, this model has the state dependence. The key is state dependence. The fact that this hazard is not flat, which means that agents that need to respond will respond. 
when there is a shock. And, and does it matter? Here's the answer, it does. So what they do, they focus a lot of their analysis on selection. In particular, they define selection. I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but you saw it in Peter's slide. They, they run these linear probability models where, say, probability of price increases is run on, uh, you know, on, the, on a measure of the, sh of the aggregate shock, of the gap, and of their interaction. And the interaction is their intuitive idea of whether or not you have selection because given an aggregate shock, you know, the probability that you adjust should be bigger if the gap is bigger. Fine. And that's what they find. They don't find this coefficient on the selection term being significant. Okay, so what do I think about this? To me, it's a bit of a distraction. But let me think about it nevertheless. So let's, let me explore the theory behind these regressions, the theory behind the metrics. Should I expect or should I not expect the interaction term to matter in these regressions? Well, remember the theory has a definition of x. The x includes the aggregate shocks. The way they measure the x's, this x hat, is the difference between one firm X and the other firm X. Now, because everybody is affected by the aggregate shocks, their X's do not have the aggregate shock in, by construction, it washes out. So let me construct the theory base gap, which is their X hat plus their epsilon. The epsilon is a credit shock. I'm putting an alpha because you know I, I'm not really sure about the units. X is measured in units of price deviations, the credit shocks, you need to have some elasticities. So suppose we ask some good, guy, good micro guys about the alpha. Anyway, there's an alpha there. So now the hazard function that I expect to be working in this data is some function of x hat plus, uh, plus epsilon. So what's the question? Should we expect the interaction term? Well, it depends on the shape of lambda. If lambda is linear, then you know a linear function doesn't have any interaction term. It's a linear function. All the higher derivatives are zero. Now, here is a bit tricky. Well, it's not really linear. It's linear in the absolute value. The absolute value is not a linear function. So actually, you know, if you, it's also not differentiable at zero, but let's say you do something quick and dirty and you kind of approximate an absolute value, you're actually going to find some role for an interaction because it's a nonlinear function. Let's, let's do something simple to clear this. Suppose the hazard was quadratic. Well, then, of course, you should have an interaction term because we all know the math for the square of the binomial. But you should also have x squared and epsilon squared, not in levels. So that's why I kind of find it useful to think of the theory because it kind of guides me to what I should look for in the empirics. So I ran some, you know, I set up a model. I, I simulated some data. It was cheap, so I simulated billions of data. So the first regression you see, these are like asymptotics. That's why the T statistics are humongous. You know, if I estimate the hazard function, well, that's a model I'm using. That's a true model. Of course, I recover it, and I don't see any interaction for the, for the product. I shouldn't. I'm just checking that my code is written correctly. Hopefully, it is. Then I'm doing, also, I'm focusing, you know, another, this is a bit of a detail, but the model tells you if your gap is high today, you are just today. Now, I understand, you know, they have true data, so, and we saw that the shock takes time to realize, so they look at effects after 24 months. But you have to be careful in pushing the horizon for the outcome so far away, because if you push it really too far away, something is going to happen. At some point, they will adjust. So, for instance, in my simulation, if I put, you know, one year, Everybody adjusts in one year. I'm having a model with two adjustments per year. So, okay. So, you know, what if I misspecify the model? I, I don't, instead of estimating the absolute value, I just throw in X, epsilon, and their product. I actually find that the product is kind of borderline significant, much less than the X. Now, here there is also an issue of inference. I have billions and billions of data. I don't think they have as many aggregate shocks. So, if I like put, let me assume that in the 10 years they have, they can observe 20 aggregate shocks. So basically divide all my T stats by 10. Then I will get that stuff is not, it's like interaction and, and epsilon is borderline significant. So I'm just doing this to say, look, what, what you find really kind of depends on, first of all, functional form assumptions and the specification of the regression really depends on that, and number of observations. 
And in my simulations, it's harder to estimate the effects of epsilon because I have a large cross section, but I don't have that, that longer time series. So in the end, you know, I was thinking maybe Jean Tirol is in the room and he doesn't know about monetary policy, at least what we do. So I want, you know, are we really lost? Like, have we learned anything in the past 20 years? I think we did. So this nice paper shows, are price setters attentive? Yes, they are. Decisions depend on the state. Do we care about time or state dependent models? Do we care? I think we do. So if I was like, you know, a policymaker today, with these big energy shocks, the COVID supply bottlenecks, the trade wars, models like this behave very differently from a time-dependent model where firms are just waiting for the Calvo ferry to do an adjustment. And we have lots of evidence on, say, Swiss big surprise appreciation about how this big, when these big events occur, firms are fast. Peter's own paper on VAT changes, you know, in Hungary. Um, Alvarez, my co-author, and Numaya, Argentina, like changing the price of utilities dramatically and prices changing fast. Bottom line is when there are big shocks, there are big reactions. I think as economists, we should be proud of it because it's kind of reassuring about our job. We are, you know, suppose firms were just doing things just because, then uh, it would be a bit depressing. My final comment is something I would do with this data. So even, even in, in the little model I use, the aggregate response is very small. One way to pump up these responses is to think of models where there are strategic complementarities, where each firm's decisions about their little x also depend on the big x. That's a different lambda. And I think this is a really important big question that they could do a lot uh, with um, the data they have. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Maybe, Peter, you want to react quickly before we open up uh, to the whole audience um, and so people can still see, think a bit about questions, but maybe you want to react directly to what Francesco suggested. Almost, almost everywhere we agree, and I think I think it's very important to to emphasize that that even though so so there there is this uh, kind of potential confusion in in what we say and don't say, and and one and and importantly when we say that selection is not there, we are not saying that state dependence is not there, and I think I think it's uh, it's very useful that uh, that you pointed out that that in in this case, uh, we if we have. Uh, and, and what we show is that there is this relationship between the gap and the probability of price change. It will will have an influence on on how uh, the the aggregate economy responds, and uh, and so so we we need to go away from from a from a Carvo model. And uh, I think so. So in your your discussions, you 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 suggested uh, we we go and 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 figure out much more the theory behind the metrics i think this is this is well taken i think we 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 want to want to go there uh, just to reassure you I th actually it's true that if you go 24 months out uh, the effects are are uh, kind of the, the probability of, of, of price adjustment is much higher than if you are looking at a month out but i can uh, assure you that actually we, we still have this v shape uh, relationship mm. so so there um, the some some of the the effects are still still say and uh, and i think you are absolutely right about strategy complementarities i think it would be uh, this this data might be might be useful to to also learn learn about that thanks a lot again no thanks to you it's a great paper so are there any questions from the audience? There's also the Slido tool, of course. So for everybody who is online um, attending us, please feel free to ask your questions in Slido. If not, I have a question actually, sort of more also from a, let's say, pr practitioner point of view. I mean, you did your study basically on US data and that covered a span from 2001 to 2012 when inflation was actually relatively low in comparison to if you would look at it now. Um, and also, if you look at the shocks, I mean, nowadays we're confronted a lot with, um, let's say, aggregate uh, supply shocks. I mean, in how far would your results change with, let's say, more a higher inflation regime or an, a, a regime shift where you have actually more this aggregate shocks, uh, demand sh uh, supply shocks than uh, um, demand shocks, for example? 
Yeah, so, so thanks for the, for the question. Uh, so so one, one thing is that uh, in this uh, uh, Prisma network, so price, I think micro data analysis network, we, we have actually acquired similar data for the URA area, and we found that the, the results are, are kind of qualitatively comparable, and we can, we can compare also quantities. So, so this, is, this is something uh, uh, which, uh, which I want to point out. Uh, unlucky, so I mean, luckily in, 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 in actual sense, inflation was low also for the period we have, we have the data. So in, in some sense, we cannot directly look at the, the evidence, uh, how it changes, but we would like to in the, in the future. But we can use these uh, theoretical models to, to have some ideas about how the, how, how the, the results would change if the shocks would be larger or inflation would be, would be higher. And, uh, and actually what we, what we find is that if, if the shocks are large, then there will be kind of much larger effect, much, uh, much more firms would, would adjust. And also if the trend inflation is, is, uh, is higher, then, then we, we should expect uh, more, more firms adjusting. So overall, the, the slope of the Phillips curve should be should be actually higher in in uh, in these in these situations, mm -hmm. and and actually quantitative models could try to give kind of quantitative numbers for for this, but that might uh, might depend a lot on the on the particular uh, details and assumptions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, there is a raised hand. I think there's somebody with a microphone that could come. Yes, M maybe introduce yourself quickly. Hi, I'm Alistair Mackay. Um, I was hoping Peter could sort of elaborate on the motivation for looking at the dynamics conditional on a identified shock, because as Francesco pointed out, we can calculate the sort of aggregate dynamics directly from a GHF. So just want to hear sort of the rationale for, for the value of the identified shock. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think uh, in in some sense, what we so I think I think there is some some difference in the philosophy of uh, of the paper and uh, and for example Fra uh, Francesco's approach. So here we kind of wanted to establish empirical results with kind of minimal assumptions on the on the economy, and uh, and here we we. It's, it's true that after we have this, 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 if we are ready to use the assumptions of the model, then we basically have everything what we need. But if we kind of not ready to, to make these kind of strong assumptions of, the, of, of, the, of a structural model, then it would be useful to actually establish some evidence using, using an aggregate shock and, and, and just, just looking at what, what happens there. And, and I think in some sense we are lucky that, uh, that, it, that these results are actually borne out more or less from, from kind of theoretical models that we use. So it kind of supports these, these models and then, then you can say that, uh, that you know, we, we wouldn't need to, need to do this, but I think, I think it's still useful to kind of, kind of deliver structural effects and then we can compare it to, to kind of models, but kind of different types of models as well. We also hope that uh, that for kind of an audience who, who who is kind of not too not not that deep into kind of structural models, these these results are are interesting and uh, and provide some intuition. Can, can I add one thing? Yes. Yeah. Sure. So it, my my take on that was, you know, when I said after his figure two, I would stop here and I would just be happy and be able to calculate aggregate impulse responses, of course, that's under the assumption that that's a data generating process. But in my one thing I find interesting is that they're kind of testing this model, right? We know, for instance, rational inattention models where people pay a different attention to different types of shocks, aggregate versus idiosyncratic. So I like their experiment. They're trying to set up, like, let's see if they respond to X as they respond to Epsilon. So once you Say I would do it maybe only positive so that there's no functional form confusion and and just focus on you know the straight line and run a regression on these positive probabilities on epsilon and x and and but then you know maybe you could find that they don't respond to epsilon, maybe they're not paying attention to epsilon. So that's additional information in my view. Thank you. 
Anybody else? So there, there's a raised hand. Uh, Morten Raman. <clears throat> now, I was wondering whether, um, so you have all this micro data. Is, it is a bit special because it is from supermarkets, so uh, lots of goods, lots of things that we don't have in that. But should we really, should we think that the price of uh, milk is sort of done the same way as the price of uh, a car? So should we really, I'm just wondering about the extent to which we should think of one model of price setting or not. I mean, we know in the core CPI that the goods there are different from uh, commodities and so on. And uh, uh, so, so to what extent should we aggregate at this level here? There's one model of price setting. Is that useful for monetary policy? Maybe we take one more question than uh I saw a raised hand before, but, ah, yeah, okay, look. There's somebody with a mic here, here Luke. Ah. Yeah, maybe just to round it off, um, Francesca, you said we, we've learned a lot, at least we know which models are incorrect, and I can tell you, sort of at least from a theoretical perspective, where things will be going. So I wanted to push the chair's question a little bit more since there are many on the call that are actually doing monetary policy um, and, and maybe less familiar with these models that you write down, what would be the prescription for monetary policy from your theory for where we are today in terms of not just large shocks but also a high inflation environment? Maybe I give the floor for the last three minutes back again yeah. to you, Peter. Okay. So, so Morton's point, I, I, I think, I think it's, it's very well taken. So I think, I think it's uh, uh, when, when people look at particular markets, they usually kind of look at price setting, which is, which is very different in, in, in different uh, uh, areas. So I think in, in some sense, what, what we are uh, trying to do is, is simplify Simplify the the reality to be and, and ask whether we can we can learn something that that is that is useful uh, and and actually in the paper we we also look at PPI uh, so so producer price index microdata which which covers not just supermarkets but uh, but basically the the whole economy and and we find that that at least these these results that we that we look at are 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 kind of Consistent, so robust, robust there, so that we find that that there is this uh, this uh, state dependence as well, but not not the not not the selection. So, uh, I mean, we we hope hope that it's it is it is useful, but I think there is uh, uh, if 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 someone wants to dig deeper, there is there, there's great great gains could be could be have from from kind of really understanding. The, the details of, of price setting in different uh, different markets. Uh, in in terms of um, um, uh, how, how the so what what uh, can we learn? I think I think this is a this is a very very hard question. Uh, but in in some sense, one one uh, potential answer is that is that a, a lot of these the, what the literature is after is really the Kind of effective slope of the Phillips curve, and and this, and and uh, what we kind of get out from from uh, looking at microdata is that this slope is actually higher than uh, than previously assumed. Uh, so uh, we we actually need to kind of design optimal policy based based on this, and and uh, I mean it 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 really. So, so what 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 to do is kind of depends on a lot of a lot of factors. For example, what kind of shock is is uh, is hitting you? But uh, but actually, I think looking at the literature, the what we we already know quite a lot. Uh, what you should do based on the 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 slope of the Phillips curve. Yes, Francesco. Yeah, my my, my take on I agree with Peter. It's a, obviously a difficult question as most policy questions, but but there's some like high level thing that we understand using this model, which is 
when we live in normal times, we don't see that many price changes and we think, oh, prices are not changing that often. We don't really know why that is. Are they not paying attention or is that because? Now, what we know if we think that these kind of models, the state dependent models are behind the process is that once a big shock arrives, they, firms will not wait. They, you will have a cluster of price changes. As we are seeing, you will see more frequent price changes. You will see a larger fraction of price increases going up big time. And the reason I would worry as a policymaker, similarly to what happened when you know, many countries joined the euro, consumers who are not that educated in following these tendencies, they see lots of price increases, they see prices changing everywhere. This thing can get out of hand. This is a very delicate time. It's a very different behavior if you look at the, develop, the unfolding of one of these shocks in one of these time-dependent models where, you know, you have to wait for the ferries. Firms don't wait for the ferries. So now we're in the middle of the storm and we need to reassure the markets that we know what's going on and we're taking measures to avoid second round effects, etc. Thank you very much. I can completely concur that indeed what we see also at the moment is a much quicker pass through of these shocks to now the consumer price level. And I think this work that you're doing, Peter, and, and also others are doing in this Prisma network is very useful for us to kind of gauge such effects and be more aware also for the future. So thank you very much.